Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's May 10th, 2024, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Jonathan Saha, Professor of South Asian History at Durham University and an author of two books on Burmese history. Jonathan was last on Myanmar Musings in 2017 when we discussed animal history in Burma. And since then, his book, Colonising Animals, Interspecies Empire in Myanmar, has been released with Cambridge University Press. But today, we will be discussing two research articles Jonathan has published since then, both on peasant rebellions in colonial Burma. Hello, Jonathan. Hi, Luke. It's lovely to be speaking with you again. Yes, it's been far too long. Now, before we get uh, into your research, your angle on peasant insurgency in Burma, let's talk a bit about what we can sort of say we know from from the historical record about, in particular, um, the Sayasan Rebellion, which is the peasant insurgency that you focused on in these two these two articles. So you've called this this insurgency a, a crisis of social reproduction. Um, but for those who don't know anything about what what a Sayasan is, um, who was Sayasan, and and what was was this rebellion? So. The standard narrative of this rebellion is that Sayasan was a indigenous medical practice, practitioner as well as being a anti-colonial activist and organizer who was going around trying to mobilize people to resist colonial taxation and refuse to pay. He then broke away from the mainstream nationalist organizations of the time and began to form his own association called the Galon Association. And this movement is what formed the underlying organizational structure for the launching of a rebellion in December 1930 and a rebellion that lasted after Sayasan's capture and Uh, execution at the end of 1931, well into 1932, and involved over 7,000 further Indian army troops to suppress. So it is both in terms of the area of colonial control that they were managed to overturn, and in terms of the amount of resource that the colonial state needed to spend suppressing it, Possibly the largest peasant revolt in British India since the 1857 uprising, with the possible exception of the fighting against the imposition of colonial rule in colonial Myanmar after 1885. So a really major moment in British imperial history um, and a very important moment in the history of Myanmar itself. That traditional story, that traditional narrative that I just provided has been questioned somewhat in in a few different ways. It has been read by prominent sociologists and anthropologists of the 1970s instead as representing a rebellion inspired by the threat of the market and of colonial rigid bureaucracies to the subsistence of peasants Um, and that is what has been identified as the as the cause for it rather than the sort of machinations of anti-colonial nationalists and more recently it has been questioned as a whole whether it actually makes up one singular revolt um, or whether that is more of a figment of the colonial or imperial archive that was operating with the imperative of arresting and trying large numbers of captured rebels. So our understanding of it in some ways has got less and less clear over the last 20 or 30 years. And importantly, historians have been questioning their the basis upon which we think we understand what happened during the Sayasan Rebellion. So one of the things which has come out of that, which I think reveals the extent to which we now perhaps know less about the rebellion than we thought we did 
40, 50 years ago, is whether it's meaningful to describe it as being something led by Sayasan, or organized or inspired by Sayasan at all, and rather think of it as maybe a series of interconnected but local revolts and that spread across the country, emulating one another with different aspects of uh, what mobilized those particular groups. I suppose there's also a political dimension to that because Sayasan is kind of venerated by the, the military state in, in Myanmar. Um, there's names wrote, named after him and he's seen as a, you know, as an anti-colonial, anti-colonialist first and foremost, right? And that's how people are taught in school. Absolutely. And so the scholar who has explored this problematic reliance on the colonial legal archive is Maitri Antoine. And in his book, the Galong King, he does draw those connections right through from the colonial archive, right through to contemporary um, state veneration of Sayasan, demonstrating that there are aspects of the narrative, core parts of that narrative that have remained unchanged and that that colonial legacy is still somewhat ironically very present in the ostensibly post-colonial uh, national histories that have followed it. And um, you've referred to Maitri Aung Thuyen's book and you also referred to uh, the thesis of James Scott, a very well-known um, scholar regarding um, peasant subsistence and his famous case study from moral, the moral economy of the, of the peasant. Um, now, you mentioned also um, that ethnicity, for example, is completely absent from, from Scott's take. I don't know how much it's, it's in the other major work, um, Maitri Ong Twin, but you certainly have focused a lot on this sort of categorization of people um, and the social construction of race and ethnicity. When you look at the uh, Sayasan Rebellion or whatever we, we rename it, if it's less about Sayasan. So I want to ask you about that. Uh, we know a little bit now about the rebellion itself. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, I think that, you know, these days, uh, bureaucracies have slowly moved towards, institutions have, and people tend to, to use the word ethnicity more than race um, in 2024. In your Sayasan Rebellion articles, you refer to both these terms uh, in relation to scholarly theories. Um, you write about ethnicity and how it's performatively enacted through violence. And you write about ethnic space, an interesting idea in one article, but you also use terms racialization and racial capitalism as main analytics in the other, both looking at different case studies in the Sayasan Rebellion. So I just wanna ask you a kind of question about these terms, which can be very confusing. So are there differences between these categories, ethnicity and race, and the way that um, they've been used by other scholars in other situations and the way that you're using them to look at the rebellion? It's a it's a really good question. And I really appreciate actually being, being pushed on this. There's two reasons for why I've used these terms in these articles in different ways. One is the intellectual traditions that I'm building on within those specific articles. Um, and the other is the way that reflexively we use particular terms for particular community groups. So if I start with the former, I wrote an article on racial capitalism and peasant insurgency using the and a particular set of events in the Sayasan Rebellion, in, indeed a particular massacre of some Indian cattle herders, as a way of exploring the ways in which the peasants' experiences of uh, the threats that brought about or unfolded from the fall in the rice price um, as a result of the, the global depression, the way that those threats became understood or articulated through a sense of the Burmese peasantry as uh, autochthonous and uh, representing a particular racial identity and Indian populations, not just moneylenders, but also more subaltern and equally marginalized agrarian communities as threatening racial others. And my reason for doing so was to partly shed light, further light on the history of the Sayasan Rebellion, but 
the sort of bigger intellectual question that I was trying to address through the history of Myanmar was the problem of racial capitalism as a theoretical concept. So it's often used as a way of showing how capitalism divided populations or embedded or reinforced racial divisions in in societies. And that is a useful prompt for scholars. But what I felt it didn't help us explain was the subjective experiences of marginalized or subaltern populations. Can we take for granted or be certain that just because capitalism may operate in such a way that those populations thought of themselves within those same racial terms? And so I wanted to explore whether that was apparent in the Sayasan Rebellion and how we might be able to explain it. And the argument that I try to build there is that whilst there are signs of this being a racialized conflict or racialized conflicts characterizing aspects of the rebellion, that's very much a contingent history. It didn't have to be like that. And it took time for that to, to develop. So there's a longer history of the racialization of the Burmese peasantry that we might trace feeding into this. And then there's the specifics of the emergence of anti-Indian violence in the late 1920s and into the 30s that feed into that process. And the, the wider sort of prompt that comes out of that is to ask the questions of when and why do racial identities become pertinent to subaltern groups. So the, the re- one of the reasons I use race to refer to the different parties or different communities in that particular article is because of the intellectual tradition that I'm engaging with there. But the other reason is there is a tendency uh, to represent the tensions between Burmese and Indian populations in colonial Myanmar as racial tensions rather than ethnic ones. The other article which I wrote was in a special collection on the concept of communal geographies. And for that piece, I went back to another sort of classic text in the history of peasant revolts, and that's Ranajit Guha's Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency in Colonial India. This is a sort of incredible book maybe a, a sort of a, in the canon of post-colonial studies. And he makes this really overlooked, I think, argument that one of the key dynamics to peasant insurgencies in 19th century India is this tension between the peasants' conception of themselves as a particular ethnic group and them belonging to a particular space that belongs to that ethnic group and the realities of how land and territory is actually parceled up between different communities. And that gives a, an impetus to mobilize and to spread the revolt for Ranajit Guha, but it also imposes geographical limits to peasant revolts imbuing them with a particular sense of, of localism. And though that, so that tension between who belongs to the revolting ethnic community, peasant community, and who doesn't, and where those parameters end, are, I thought, overlooked aspects to the Sayasan Rebellion. And in the article, I looked at the violence that happens against Chin villages, not located in the in the Chin Hills, but uh, located in what was in the colonial period called Prome District or Pie. And in those instances, you have these quite ambiguous moments where rebels mobilized from Burmese or Bama majority villages would march to Chin majority villages in order to demand payments for being part of a rebel association, capture people, 
extort money in order to secure their release. And often following this, commit other acts of violent atrocities and murdering individuals in those villages. And these attacks happen at a later point in the rebellion, once it is clearly faltering in the face of colonial repression. But nonetheless, I felt that ambiguity revealed that tension between this space being imagined by the rebels as one in which everyone, all the peasants, would be participating and part of the community. But the Chin populations sitting at least partly ethnically outside of that. They could have been seen as comrades in the revolt, and there may have been some hopes that they would still be that. But in the end, they ended up being labelled as outsiders of the revolt and therefore fair game for some of these attacks, ethnically defined difference. So I'm using ethnic there in part because that's the terminology that uh, Ranajit Guha uses when he looks at the peasant insurgencies of colonial India in the 19th century. But there is also a tendency to describe the differences between Burmese minority communities in the country who are more straightforwardly perceived as indigenous, as ethnic groups and ethnic differences rather than racial differences. Now, if I was going to place these two articles together, and at some point, if I do anything more sort of joined up about the Sayasam Rebellion, I think I would have to confront more seriously the ambiguities of using these two different terms for these two different communities. And I think actually the difference between them is a soft difference. I don't think there's a hard difference between ethnicity and race, at least in the, the arguments that I'm making here. Both of them are produced through long historical processes, but also made meaningful in specific episodes of conflict and strife. And so we might think of them both as performative in the sense that someone behaving like or acting like a particular community group is part of what produces that sense of being or their existing that community or group. Whether we describe it as race or whether we describe it as ethnicity is perhaps an overdetermining uh, investment in the, in the language. And I'm not sure, actually, from the few bits that I've read um, in Burmese from the time, that it is one that clearly maps onto Burmese language terms being used, where there seems to be sort of interchangeable terminology um, for communities as a whole. So it's one that I'm going to have to work through. I don't know if I've provided a fully sort of satisfactory answer to you there, but I think it's a useful prompt to, to get us all, all of us who work on or report on or think about Myanmar to be really, I think, more intentional about where we're using the word ethnicity and where we're using the word race. And that might be because we do see or we believe there to be significant differences between how those communities actually exist and are reproduced in Myanmar, or it might be because of the different intellectual traditions that we're working with. But so long as we're aware and understand of why we're using those terms, um, I think we can have open, clear communications about what those terms mean for us without those terms actually becoming barriers to um, meaningful conversations. It can become quite vexing and you sort of notice that it's an it's an English language thing and it's to do with the the building up over time in of, of literature and of and of ideas and, and of politics and everything. And of course in Burmese, yes, um, you've got things like Lumio, which is very malleable and as you point out in the article from other scholars' work they've written about how it's changed over time as to how it maps onto I'm not sure, I can't remember the term that you used, just a sort of like ethnic, ethnic race-based ideas, uh, whereas it used to be sort of a more about karmic um, stuff and more relational, I think. 
And then, of course, they've got um, Danyan Da, which is used um, a lot just as a sort of non non Bama kind of moniker for um, living away. And then, and then uplands, and that, that's that's the other big big sort of cleavage. And none of those map onto um, race and ethnicity the way that English speakers like to use them. Yeah. I was. It struck me when you were giving that very good um, and um, detailed answer. Thank you. Uh, you were talking about how you wanted to try and understand a little bit about subjective experience of, you know, of these people and what what they conceptualize others as. How do you get at that uh, as a historian? Um, you know, when you're trying to find things to, um, you know, you need sources in order to understand what happened in the past. Yeah. So I think. No, one of the reasons I wrote these articles was that I'd been teaching on Sayasan and I'd been teaching simultaneously a module on subaltern studies. And going back to those very early writings of subaltern studies, which was a radical history group formed in the early 1980s of historians of of India, um, was the extent to which they were very skeptical and circumspect about the possibilities of accessing subjectivities primarily through or putting too much value on Indian language sources. And they do use those, and they are keen in excavating those, but they're very very critical of the communities that are actually able to access and shape those types of sources. And instead, there is a strong theme of close critical analysis of the colonial archive, which is an extensive, comprehensive archive, which is often much more concerned with the activities and actions of marginal or subaltern groups who do not often produce and leave written records of their own. And I think this particular point has often been lost when people have tried to recover or engage with what might have been people's subjective experiences. The Sayasan Rebellion resulted in a huge legal archive. And with it comes all those narrative problems that Matrion Quinn identified. But with the specific cases that were brought in, we can see the evidence which was produced and we can see what was done, some of the physical actions of revolt that peasants involved themselves in. And there are implications from those actions about what the subjectivities may have been that drove them. Now, there's not an obvious or clear way of determining in a um, completely confident fashion what it was that was motivating or compelling those rebels to act in the way that they did. But we can contextualize that within the time and we can think about what it would have meant to commit those acts, what organization would have gone in to committing those acts, and those, those have implications. So in looking at the, the massacre of these Indian cattle herders in, in one of the articles, it was clear from where these rebels camped, encamped themselves in order to find cattle herders, that there was a deliberate and planned effort to ambush them. Um, And then we can contextualize that within the ethnic makeup of those who worked in that area of employment. And we can contextualize that within the political economy of the rice industry in which access and the value, or access to and the value of cattle were becoming points of considerable tension for peasant cultivators. And through that, we can start to piece together a picture of why it may have been that this particular band of peasant rebels focused on and identified this group of cattle herders to attack. And when they did attack them, they separated the group based on what they perceived that group's ethnicity or race to be. And so those who were Burmese or perceived to be Burmese were were separated from those who were Indian. And that's interesting because there are some ambiguities apparent in the physical evidence that the colonial state records there. 
One of those who was released was a man called uh, Ishmael, and he's recorded in the record as being a, a Burmese Muslim. Um, and one of the men who was uh, killed was dressed in what would be typically Burmese attire, had a Burmese name, and had a Burmese wife. And so we can start to pose questions from that somewhat innocuous, unproblematic pieces of material evidence. What the basis for those separations might have been. They probably weren't sartorial. It sounds possibly like they may have been more on uh, assumed physical differences between the parties. So when you get into the detail of those types of archives, you, you can you can start to, I think, come up with reasoned and if not 100% watertight, I think pretty compelling explanations of what some of the subjective experiences may have been. There are, though, far more archival and material remains from the records, uh, from the Sayasan Rebellion, than have been looked at. So the focus on the legal archive has come at the expense of the photographic archive that is quite extensive. The uh, military archive that includes details of logistics, which gets us to think about how the rebels used the environment, what their understandings of the topography would have been, how they engaged with seasonal advantages or disadvantages that they may have been confronted with. And there are a small amount, but some significant pieces of material culture that have survived the revolt. There is a what's described as a handkerchief held by the Royal Geographic Society that was in the possession of one of the rebels, which is quite an incredible piece of documentary evidence of the subjective experiences or understandings of the rebels, containing in the middle an image of the Buddha and around it a series of aphorisms about protecting themselves from the threats of counterinsurgency forces. We have photographs of banners as well and of the uniforms of the rebels. But this type of material evidence hasn't really yet to be engaged with by, by me or, or by anyone else, and nor has there been any sort of systematic attempt to go through the extensive museum archives in the UK and beyond that hold materials from Burma and likely hold materials from the rebellion as well. So I think there's a lot more to be done to explore the extent to which we can actually access um, those, those mindsets. That sounds like a call for potential graduate research students at Durham University uh, to me, <laughs> if anybody's interested in a PhD. Um, uh, so I, I skipped the titles at the beginning um, of this podcast, of the articles, so we could get straight into it. But um, for listeners who've come this far, the two articles we're talking about are, one, Communal Geographies and Peasant Insurgency in Colonial Myanmar, and that's in the South Asia Journal of South Asian Studies, and Racial Capitalism and Peasant Insurgency in Colonial Myanmar in the History Workshop Journal. Now, given the what you've just described about the sources and the fact that you teach on the Sai Sun Rebellion and you've written these two articles, getting you to think about the rebellion in different ways together with different scholars, uh, do you think you'll take your interest in the rebellion um, further or any of these ideas further? Any more articles or, or a book or anything? Yeah, I would like to. I'm uh, giving a talk in a few months on visual culture and peasant insurgency, which I'm quite excited about, looking at some of the photographs I mentioned earlier, but also some of the propaganda art produced by the colonial regime um, to try and combat the, the revolt, produced by the very famous modern Burmese artist Ban Yan. So there, are, there is a lot more to be said there. I would like to write something as well on the environmental history of 
the peasant insurgency. Well, if you're going into environmental history, then your work may intersect with uh, James Scott's again. His, his next book, In Praise of Floods, is environmental history about the Iwati River. So there you go. <laughs> Great. I look, up, I look forward to that. Flooding is, um, is, a, you know, is a part of the prehistory of the revolt, as well as a major earthquake that hits Myanmar in the middle of 1930. And these contextual aspects of it haven't, haven't really been given uh, given their due attention, I don't think. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so lastly, I'm thinking about peasant insurgencies. I'm thinking about insurgencies in Myanmar because Myanmar is still rife with insurgency. Um, this is kind of, uh, if you were going to characterize, you know, the country since independence, I think that that would be, the you'd be on very solid ground if that's how you just chose to characterize it. There's been constant insurgencies. Uh, but I guess the the identity of a peasant is only sort of identifiable through certain lens of capitalism right as a sort of other in some way um to that so when do insurgencies stop being peasant insurgencies i mean stuff that's happening in sagain region at the moment it's like i i, I can sort of see some con continuities to peasant insurgency but most people today when they um engage however they do in uh, the conflict that's happening in Myanmar, they wouldn't be thinking about peasants anymore necessarily or peasant insurgencies. But with that said, um, you know, uh, terms such as resilience get thrown around a lot at the moment and some communities that are rebelling at, against the centre are more resilient than others, which often when it goes down to it actually sort of means that they are more self-sufficient, that they're actually closer to being a... Peasants. Okay, so this is a bit of a, a bit of a spiel there. But what I guess the question is, what do you think about this idea of what makes an insurgency a peasant insurgency, and do they still happen in Myanmar? So, yeah, you're absolutely right about the definition of a peasant, which is one that is often posited almost as a internal, semi-incorporated other of capitalist relations, and. I think when the revolt happened, like for many of us who are connected with Myanmar, um, we were having to rethink a little bit our relationship with with our with our studies, with our activism, and for me, it prompted a rethinking of the type of subjects that I wanted to study and wanted to to uncover, and I think. What getting back to the Saisan Rebellion has encouraged me to think about is the extent to which there was a tendency to think of peasants as revolting as all too easy a step. Um, it's almost almost like a a default position for peasants to to go to, when actually it inherently involves a great deal of sacrifice and risk and disruption to day-to-day -day activities that are necessary for for maintaining people's livelihoods putting food on the table maintaining their families there's a lot of danger in engaging with with a revolt for, for, for peasant communities there's a lot of vulnerability there and that vulnerability is exposed in the course of the revolt not just by the counterinsurgency forces but by the changing seasons and by the, the demands of the harvest and the seasonality of the work. And so whilst I think there may be a tendency to see peasant revolts as perhaps more inclined to revolt or inherently more resilient modes of revolt, I don't think that's inherently the case. And I think there may actually be more continuities at least in broader terms, between what we saw happening in in the 1930s and what, what we see happening today. Difficult decisions, trying to find ways of keeping resistance going in a hostile climate and in a space where a degree of self-sufficiency and embeddedness in an agrarian space are critical factors. Um, and 
understandably, the immediate moments of the resistance to the military or attempted military coup brought these incredible images of urban unrest and mass mobilizations that are hugely evocative and inspirational, but may not capture the heart of the problem facing a long-term resistance movement. And in that respect, peasant revolts, I think, are an important usable history for people to return to. And in that way, going back to the things which I was looking at, the ethnic differences that became hardened in these revolts, the racial tensions that channeled anger and violence towards other vulnerable groups are important, really important lessons to, to engage with. For Ranajit Guha, this tension between ethnicity and uh, locality, the way that it enabled a peasant revolt to spread quickly and be hugely inspirational to other communities around them, was also what limited it. And at the time that he was engaging with this, you know, he was looking at the failings of the Naxalite uprisings in, in northern India. And he was thinking through the failings of the politics of Maoism as he understood it and engaged with it. And whilst that overarching revolutionary politics may not be so pertinent today, the questions of maintaining an inclusive resistance movement as one that is able to perpetuate itself and keep a wide geographic support base is a, a really live problem and a live political question. So I hope this hasn't been too sort of rambling an answer. Um, it's very much a historian's answer, I think. But um, there is there is more to be gleaned from the Sarsan revolt than um, than it may seem on on first first instance. Yes, I've, uh, there's just one more. I've just got one more question that's come to me now, um, listening to you, which is about your um, your style. I've read so many of your articles now, uh, and you know chapters um, from your thesis and book, first book. Uh, that you know your 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 style as an historian seems to be to take these case studies and then build out and make your points on discrete sort of um, events that happened in time. And you 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 you're absolutely have written longer works and tie multiple you know things together and i don't mean that you only ever work on isolated things but um i consider that to be something very nice about reading your work even though i'm not you know as engaged with all the theories all the time so that you are testing and working with i always get something like empirically interesting about you know these events they're um like fascinating to think with um I wonder whether you have ever considered writing sort of something more narrative history-like or maybe more popular history-like, uh, since you are now so many years deep in the history of Burma, um, it would be just a joy uh, to read something like that. But I suppose the, you know, you only have so many hours in the day. That's, that's very kind of you to say, Luke. And it is, I think it, it's the type of history I like to write. Um, and it's also a way of resisting, I guess it's a way of resisting what may be broader fashions in the history, historical community of writing global histories or writing imperial histories. I'd, I'd rather see the world through the specifics of things happening to people rooted in a place than valorize histories of mobilization, of movements, of great networks of interconnection. Um, I don't actually think those are the histories that speak to uh, 
the experiences of the vast majority of the world in the past. Um, so that that's part of it. And in terms of writing something more for a popular history, it is certainly something I am thinking about and in a small way acting towards, um, but nothing concrete enough or complete enough to divulge at this point. Fantastic. All right. Look forward to it. Uh, now, the final question on every episode for every guest is um, simply for you to recommend something to our listeners. Uh, it could be um, anything related to, to Burma or Myanmar. What would, it, what would it be? So I was thinking about this quite a lot, and I was, I was wondering whether to recommend something outside of, of Burmese history um, where I think there's still really valuable insights and and lessons to to be drawn from it and so you probably noticed that both of my article titles follow the same format um, and that format is derived very clearly from Ranajit Guha's Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency which is now a book nearly 40 years old more than 40 years old indeed um, but is a very unusual an incredible piece of writing and history that remains engaged with political problems, but I think has been caricatured over time and perhaps even fallen off reading lists. And so I'd recommend revisiting it if you've read it before or, or going to it for the first time if it's if it's not something that has been on your radar. Yeah, that's a really good recommendation. And um, I wonder if you've also been, the way that you write has been inspired a bit by by, by that book, um, which was also not a narrative sort of based um, history text. Great, excellent recommendation. Um, wonderful. And, and really, really good good to chat. And uh, I look forward to reading more myself about the Sayasan Rebellion and thinking about um, the points that you've made. Uh, and also having you back on the show when, when you've, um, whenever you are ready uh, next. Thanks very much, and I look forward to speaking to you in the future.